Hello to our second topic of uh, talking about the principles of history taking in orthopedics and how it is different from the other history taking in general surgery and medicine. So the aim of our presentation is uh, to talk about the general history taking structure, about the specific symptoms to think about in orthopedic patients, history and trauma. The structure of the general structure of history taking in orthopedics is the same as any history. You start with the patient profile, the presenting and chief complaint, analysis of this chief complaint, past medical and surgical history, social history, and family history. Now, the symptoms are specific for orthopedic patients pain, swelling, stiffness, deformity weakness, instability, change in sensibility, and loss. Let's talk about pain first. You know that the way to analyze pain as chief complaint is easy if you use the acronym Socrates. Stands for where uh, the pain is, that's the site, the onset. When did the pain start? Was it sudden or gradual? Character of the pain? Radiation, does it radiate anywhere? Associations with other signs and symptoms? The time course, does it follow any certain patterns? Exacerbating and relieving factors? Anything changes the pain characteristics? And severity, we usually use the visual analog scale from 1 to 10 to describe the severity of the pain. Now you should think about certain factors in pain analysis. Now, a progression in relation to certain problems, like in tumors, usually if it's associated with pain, that's a constant pain. In trauma patients, it's, it is a sudden severe pain, increases in the first six hours, and then decreases with stability of the fracture, let's say. In acute inflammation, it is sudden, increasing, then subsides. Chronic inflammation, usually it's up and down, remissions and exacerbation. If there's a new origin of pain in painless disease, like a malignant change or a pathological fracture. The quality of the pain in arthritis, it's usually it's a dull, aching pain. A stabbing, sharp pain, usually associated with rupture tendons, a burning pain, it's usually neurological, neuralgia, a throbbing pain is absent and infection. When you talk about describing swelling, you should not all, uh, you should talk always about the onset of the swelling. When did this uh, swelling started? When the patient noticed this swelling? Was it rapid? to develop over a short period of time. You should always consider hemoarthrosis in the joint or hematoma in a muscle if it's after a direct hit or injury. If it's a slowly progressing swelling, then you should think about inflammation or infection. Is it associated with pain? A painful swelling, usually it's an acute inflammation, infection. Uh, if it's a painless swelling, Usually it's a benign growth or tumor or low-grade malignancy. The progression of the swelling, is it constant swelling or increasing in size with time? If it's increasing in size, that's a neoplastic. Does it decrease and re-increase again, recollect again? Usually it's associated with inflammation. It's an inflammatory swelling. If it hardens in month, you should consider myositis ossificans, which is ossification of the muscle. Now, if you look at the pictures, you can see that there is a difference between the right and the left knee. There is an effusion in the right knee, and this is an intraarticular infusion, effusion. But if you look at the middle picture, you can see that the swelling is outside the joint. It is an extraarticular swelling. Now, if you, should, if you look at the lower picture, when you look at the patient with such type of swelling that involves the joint and the long uh, part of, uh, of the thigh, you should always consider malignancy with this patient. 
In your analysis of uh, stiffness, you should always consider the location. Is it generalized? So you think about inflammatory conditions like rheumatoid arthritis or ankylosing spondylitis. If it's localized to one or two joints, you should consider osteoarthritis, an aging process. The timing of stiffness. Is it early morning? That's one of the features of rheumatoid arthritis. If it's after a period of inactivity, the patient sits for a while. When he tries to stand up, he cannot extend his knee. That goes with osteoarthritis. And you should differentiate between stiffness and locking. Stiffness, it is a decrease in the range of motion all through the range of motion. The patient slowly extend and flex the joint versus locking, which is a sudden inability to perform a movement in a certain direction. If you look at this picture, this is a rheumatoid hand. And if you ask the patient to do a, a fist, he will do the fist slowly. And he thinks and feels that the hand is stiff. In comparison to the lower picture, which is a picture of triggering, trigger finger. So the patient can flex the finger, then it gets stuck. When he tries to extend it, a sudden popping happens then the patient can fully extend his finger. Uh, the other thing if you want to consider is the knee. Stiffness in the knee is a feature of osteoarthritis and blocking of the knee should consider a mechanical thing that blocks the movement in certain direction, like a loose body or a torn meniscus. Deformity. You should know what's a normal variant and what is pathological. Now, if you consider the, uh, let's look at the knee in this picture and on the left, this is a newborn with bowing of the legs or genovirus. The knee is in virus. That's normal for up to the age of two years. Then to the age of four years, there is a peak in a valgus knee or genovalgus. Then the patient resumes to have the normal adulthood vagus of the knee, which is about five to seven degrees. Now, if you compare it to the other picture and you compare the right and the left lower limbs, you can see clearly that there is a deformity, a genovagus deformity on the left lower limb. So if this deformity is associated with a trauma, you should consider a dislocation, a fracture, if it's painless, then it's a malunion or a contracture. Does it disappear spontaneously? Let's talk about pis planus or flat feet that grows into the arch with time. Is it progressive deformity? You should consider uh, a growth plate injury or a malignancy. Instability. Instability means ligamentous deficiency and inability of the patient to maintain a certain posture at a certain point of time. The patient complains of giving way, is un unable to maintain the posture that he wants, and there is a sudden uh, loss of stability of that joint. Weakness, neurological feature, with or without sensory loss. If there is no sensory loss, you should consider a muscle problem like motor neuropathy, myopathy, polio, motor neuron disease. Is it sudden? Then there is an injury for a tendon, muscle, or nerve. Is it progressive? Neuropathy or myopathy. Loss of function is inability of the patient to do the required function of that uh, limb. In a trauma patient, you try to take a short history direct to the point, pertinent to your management plan. And there's what is called the ample or the sample history. The S stands for the signs and symptoms that the patient presented to you uh, in the emergency room. If there's any allergies, if he's taking any medications, if there is any pertinent medical or surgical history to the presenting illness, when was the last oral intake, to consider if you're doing any emergent surgeries, and what are the events leading up to this uh, present illness or injury, or the mechanism of the injury. 
now in the of uh, fractures you should always focus on the mechanism of injury it is important in predicting the structural characteristics of your injury the fracture the pattern of the fra fracture and how are you gonna manage this uh, this injury is it a direct injury or an indirect injury if it's a direct injury where is the contact point how did it happen if it's an indirect injury was it a twisting a vulgus force a virus force and the amount of force applied to uh, to have this type of injury and the type of force transmitted through the injury itself or through the fracture itself is it a shear force a rotation is it tensile pulling that might lead to an evulsion fracture let's say is it a compression that all should be considered in the mechanism of injury so when you ask the patient about the mechanism of the injury you should consider the whole you should have a whole story a full scheme of, of how the patient had this type of injury say he he fell from a height uh, how many meters uh, how, how, where did he land how did he land when did he feel the pain uh, did he hear any popping or clicking sounds was it uh, the limb landed flat or on the side was it stuck uh, under a certain uh, obstacle let's say that's all should be con considered in your story